What's going on YouTube? Bryce builds it all here, your favorite AMP IA and part 147 instructor. And I am coming to you from step ladder because I never knew my real ladder. And I'm gonna be talking to you about the importance of compression checks and understanding uh, why we do them the way we do them, um, things to do right, things you're doing wrong, all of that good stuff. So if that interests you, as always, please stick around. First things first, I am going to apologize for the birds that are apparently making a nest or something in the hangar right now and making all kinds of noise, but I'm going to go ahead and get right into it and talk about what is a compression test and why we do them. So I'm going to start by pulling this airplane out, getting it ran, getting it good and hot, and then bringing it back in the hangar. I'll probably start the oil change, and then at the same time that the oil is draining, I will do the compression checks. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is why we do a compression check while the engine is hot. And it's very important to understand that an aircraft engine is obviously air-cooled. Most of the heat, actually all of the heat, is generated in the cylinders, and so on and so forth. So why do we do it hot? Well, some aircraft are manufactured with what we call a choke bore cylinder and or cam ground pistons, meaning the piston is not perfectly round and meaning that the cylinder is actually tapered and is a smaller diameter, diameter at the top where all of the heat is than it is at the bottom. The reason they do this is that when the engine gets hot, when it gets up to its operating temperature and all of the metal expands, the cylinder will now be perfectly straight. It will no longer be a choke bore. It will be the same diameter at the bottom that it is at the top and the piston will no longer be a cam ground. It will be perfectly round. It will be the same diameter all the way around. So we get it perfectly hot or all the way hot to get it up to those operating temperatures so that everything is in its operational dimensions that it will be when the aircraft is in flight. Now, to understand the reading, the second thing I'm gonna talk about is understanding the reading. It's not as simple as just a 60 over 80 pass fail number. What you're doing is you're putting 80 PSI of air into the cylinder to see how much pressure it holds. And that is your number on your left gauge, the 60, the 70, the 80, whatever it is on your left gauge. The best number that you can possibly get out of it being the pass fail number. Now, Continental decided at some point that the 60 over, 60 over 80 rule that the FAA came up with was not a sufficient pass fail number because it doesn't compensate for ambient temperature and it doesn't compensate for ambient pressure. Here's why that is important. You're, probably thinking, well, why would I need to adjust for ambient pressure? Well, the ambient pressure at sea level on a perfect day is completely different than the ambient pressure at Pike's Peak when it's 105 degrees. I don't know why you would be on Pike's Peak doing a compression check, but let's say for the sake of the argument you were. There will be a lot less pressure outside of the engine or in the crankcase on the crankcase side of the rings. And if there's less pressure on the crankcase side of the rings, that means there's now more pressure on the piston side of the rings. And the differential between the two is going to be different. So Continental said that's not really a fair arbitrary number to apply to all engines because it doesn't compensate for weather conditions, it doesn't compensate for ambient pressure. So they came up with a master orifice. And the master orifice is a calibrated leak which you open when you start the compression test at 80 you open that, you read the number, and then that will be your pass-fail number for that given day. As long as the cylinders are above that, they pass, and there's no more work that needs to be done. Now, understanding that when I do the compression test, I'm listening for a couple of different things. There's only three places that the compression can leak past. It can leak past the rings, it can leak past the exhaust valve uh, seat, and it can leak past the intake valve seat. Now, the intake valve is incredibly rare that it's ever going to leak from there because it's cooled by the cool air charge coming into the cylinder on each compression cycle, or on each four-stroke cycle, I should say. Man, those birds are making a bunch of noise. Sorry about that. I had to let them quiet down. So because that intake valve is cooled, it's very rarely ever going to leak from there or have a problem. However, the exhaust valve is typically your problem area and the piston rings are typically your problem area. I do think it's important to understand that heat is what kills an aircraft engine, especially because they are air-cooled. They are not liquid-cooled like a car or, well, there are some liquid-cooled aircraft engines, so don't take me 100% on that. But because they're air-cooled, managing heat is managing engine life. 
The cooler you can keep your engine running, the longer your engine will last. This is why making sure that your oil cooler is clean during annuals and all this kind of stuff is so important. Every bit of cooling that you can get going over that engine is very, very, very important. So what wears out? Well, the heat will wear the edge of the exhaust valve out and cause excessive wear in the seat and make it sort of a, a knife edge, if you will, and it's no longer that flat contact. It's now this sort of knife edge that's riding on the seat and it doesn't seal near as good as it used to. The rings, obviously, as the rings go up and down inside the cylinder, they're just gonna wear out on the cylinder wall over time. There's not really a lot you can do. Yes, keeping it cool and keeping it lubricated with good oil is going to make a big difference in how long your rings last, but eventually your rings will wear out and they will begin to drop on compression. Now, I need you to understand something very important with the rings. Your compressions will slowly fall over the life of the engine. And as the rings wear out, they will fall and fall and fall. And then one day they will start to get miraculously better. And at one day, they will start to read 80 over 80 on every single compression check. And you think, wow, my engine has 2,100 hours on it. Is this, is this magic? Is, did something change and now my engine's making full power again? And the answer is no. What's actually happened is that your rings have worn down to a point where oil is now leaking past them. And when you do a compression check, what's actually happening is that liquid, that oil that's in that cylinder, will seal up around the rings and give you a solid 88 over 80 compression check. But what's actually happening is your rings are worn beyond their serviceable limit, and now all of that oil is leaking past them and getting burned. So what you'll notice is your compressions will start to come back up on the 80 over 80 side, like I said earlier, but your oil will go from beautiful golden brown when it first goes in to black being burned from heat within a few hours of its service life. So you'll do an oil change, you'll run the engine maybe five hours, and then the engine's dark black again. And it's that way because it got discolored because of heat. So you need to look out for that. I will add, and this is the, probably the last thing I'll say on this, is that it's very, very crucially important that regardless of how many hours your engine has on it, regardless of how solid the compression numbers are, do a boroscope inspection every single time. You only actually have to do it if the engine fails the compression check, and if you had to do something to correct it, maybe you had to lap the valves, maybe you had to put new rings in it, whatever it may be. They only recommend that you do a boroscope below a certain number, like I said, if it failed. But I recommend that you do it every single time. And like I said, heat is what kills an engine. More specifically, heat is what kills an exhaust valve. But the point of doing a boroscope inspection is to look at the exhaust valve. Not look at the seat, the, the compression test will tell you if the valve seat is good or bad, but to look at the head of the exhaust valve and look for signs of discoloration. Is there detonation? Is it too rich? Is it too lean? Is it too hot? Because heat is what's going to kill your exhaust valve and just doing a compression test, just looking at that differential compression test is not sufficient to determine the health of the exhaust valve. So in order to determine the health of the exhaust valve, you really need to do a boroscope inspection and look in there. I do have good news. They do have some like really small mirrors. Sometimes you don't have to do a full boroscope. If you have enough space inside there, you can just stick a flashlight in the bottom spark plug hole and stick the mirror in the top spark plug hole and look at the, and look at the exhaust valve that way. But like I said, boroscopes are so cheap nowadays. They're not expensive like they used to be. They used to be astronomically expensive, but now they're commonplace. You can pick them up at almost any auto parts store for 20, 30, 40 bucks. You can get them on Amazon that plug right into your cell phone. So if you're doing compression checks on your own aircraft as a pilot or as a mechanic, just go buy a boroscope. They're so cheap anyways, there's no sense in not doing it. It's one of those things that I like to say is super, super cheap insurance, because it's actually free. You're just looking at something, but Get a good look at your exhaust valves. I'll see if I can put up like a, a chart of the exhaust valve health guide. There's a published by the FAA. They show you exactly what to look for. Uh, but make sure you look at your exhaust valves. That's something that's very, very important. And make sure you understand that your compression check is just an indication of how well the engine is performing. If it's below 60, it's not the end of the world. If it's on the low side, it's not the end of the world. Um, if it's on the high side, it's not the end of the world. And just because it's 80 over 80 doesn't mean it's perfect. You need to look at your compression and your oil together to determine how well your engine is working. Like I said, if your compression is 80 over 80 and the engine has a lot of hours on it and you put a flashlight down inside the cylinder, you're probably gonna see a cylinder that's full of oil and that will tell you that the oil is what's actually sealing up the rings, 
and not the rings themselves. So there you go, everyone. I hope you found this helpful. I'm actually doing an annual on this bonanza behind me. It just came in yesterday. It's very early in the morning right now while I'm filming this. Um, if you did stick around to this point, I'd like to thank you and I want some feedback. I've changed a couple things for this video. I've changed the lighting. I've got all the lights off in the hangar. I realize the sun is kind of starting to come out behind me, but I've got the lighting kind of behind the camera facing at me. So I'm experimenting with some different things. Give me an honest opinion. Do you like this? Do you like this setup? I don't know if you noticed there's a, there's a color shifting light inside the cockpit. I don't know if the camera's going to pick that up, but I thought that would be cool to have sort of a light effect inside the aircraft. So if you like that, if you thought it was cool, or if you even noticed it, leave it, leave a comment below. If you don't think it made any difference at all, let me know that too, and uh, maybe I'll do it some more. But I'm really trying to get better videos. I went ahead and bought a microphone adapter and some things from a Hero 9. I'm going to transfer from a Hero 4. The Hero 9 has got a better frame rate. It's got better focusing lenses and stuff inside of it. It's just a better camera. The Hero 4 has served me well. Well, my brother got me a Hero 9 as a, uh, as a gift when I first started my YouTube channel. Uh, so I think it's wise that I go ahead and start using that. Um, at any rate, let me know your thoughts on the lighting. Let me know your thoughts on this video and how I did things. If you want to see more videos like this or if you want to see me do it a little bit different. As always, make sure you leave us a like, leave us a comment, subscribe, join the Discord, follow me on Instagram, all of that good stuff. Send, send me an email if it's what brings you joy and happiness in your heart. I'll try to respond. Go build something and be easy.